but this kind of stemmed out of, you know, we for SFA have done a few kind of cohorts. When the first cohort that I did since I came on was kind of a group of farmers that all got pulled together by this one grant and this one project. And the, the farmers were ranging from large scale dairy producers to small grazing dairies, to beef, to crops, to sheep, to everything. And it was like, these farmers have nothing in common. How can we kind of collaborate and network and stuff? It's when everybody's coming from different perspectives. And so then, um, we did own on grazing specific and realized even then that within grazing, um, there's a lot of diversity. There's, you know, goat grazers, sheep grazers, bison grazers, cattle grazers, and, and they were all asking questions that maybe were or were not actually relevant to each other. And so we tried to get even more specific and that's kind of where this, this uh, five week livestock species came out of that. And also the recognition that most of the events in the market was based around, um, grazing beef cattle or some sort of uh, you know, beef uh, stockers, um, cow calf, something like that. Um, and there's not that much of a focus on some of the other pasture-based livestock species. And so that's kind of where this is, has come from as well. So um, we've done a five week series. We're on week four with goat production. If you've not if you've missed the last three, uh, they, I believe, are all, and if they're not already all online, uh, they will be available online here soon on our Sustainable Farming Association's YouTube channel. Um, we've done the first one was on pastured hogs, then pastured sheep, and last week was pastured bison. So uh, this week is obviously goat production, and next, year, next week is pastured chickens. So um, be sure to tune in for that one if you are interested in raising pastured chickens on your place. Um, if you miss kind of our <clears throat> very early conversation here. <clears throat> uh, I'm excited about goats because of the potential to utilize land bases that otherwise are kind of underutilized, specifically woods, and, um, but also um, just in, in general as grazing animals. But we've got two awesome guests, uh, Sherry Nolden and Jake um, from Goat Dispatch, who are gonna be sharing their kind of two unique business models uh, using goats for uh, for, for grazing both their own lands and, and also as a service is kind of a great uh, clearing and, and, and clearing business. So um, really excited for that. Um, if you guys have questions, go ahead and put them in the chat right as soon as you have them, just so we don't forget them. Um, if they're relevant to one very specific talk, I may try and jump in and, and ask it. Um, I may just leave it for later anyway, so we make sure we keep moving. Um, and, and if they're relevant to what both presenters may have, I'll for sure leave it to the end just so we can have both people answer them uh, at the end. But throw them in the chat right away so you don't forget, and then uh, we'll get to them at the end. And also that way we make sure we get through both presentations and uh, by 7.30, which, uh, and, then, and then people can hop off at any time after that if they want or stick around for questions. So uh, with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sherry. Um, and thanks so much for being here, everybody, and, and we'll get started. All right, thanks for having me and thanks for uh, your interest in this topic and all of the attendees also your interest in this topic. It's logical now with the prices of goats as high as they are, but um, like everybody else, I don't expect those prices to stay high. So uh, what I'm presenting here is um, my approach to uh, raising goats, taking advantage of um, their unique position or their unique ability to convert woody invasive vegetation into meat and other products for us. Um, so let me see if I can share my screen here. Can you see that? Can everybody hear me okay? All right, I can't see the chat, so I won't be able to respond to stuff in the chat that um, comes up as, it, as uh, you type it in as you have questions. But um, I'm both a farmer and a graduate student. Um, my bachelor's degree was wildlife ecology. My master's degree was agroecology, and I'm working on a PhD in um, animal and dairy sciences, all from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. And our farm is in um, Dodgeville, Wisconsin, Wisconsin, which is Southwest Wisconsin. And um, we've been raising meat goats since 2008. So, um, and sheep since 2001. And I've done grazing of um, lots of different species of livestock since uh, 1991. 
So in this outline, um, this is a lot, but I'm going to go through it fast. And I invite people to ask questions later, but talk about the system goals, the farm layout, how we manage from season to season, genetic selection criteria that we have for our particular goats, forage testing, um, sources of good genetics, predators and parasites, which people always have questions about, and then stocking date, um, densities and rates, economic considerations, some uh, financial sources, the reasons why we feel we're successful, and then some risks and other resources. So overall goals of our system, um, we are grain free and um, kid on pasture and don't have extensive infrastructure uh, for our goats. We want to have low costs and low labor um, in raising the goats that we have with a moderate to high value product, capture the um, context that we're in, our environment, our skills, our knowledge, our resources, have time for an off farm job so that when uh, goat prices are not as high as they are now and um, we may have some health setbacks or whatever, we aren't struggling to make payments on land that we own um, or that we have a mortgage on, we don't own it all right. Um, we also want to be able to take vacation. We want a scalable system. We want to improve the land's value, um, not only financial value, but value to um, the ecosystem services that it provides, such as wildlife habitat, soil uh, stability, water quality. Um, we personally don't like direct marketing. So that's one thing that's very different between Jake's presentation and what I'm giving here. And um, part of our when you're looking at a system, you want to understand the motivations of the people that are operating that system. And so we do as minimal direct marketing as we can. We like to just take them to the sale barn. And we plan to grow um, our goat herd to between 400 and 600 does. Most likely it'll stay at 400 unless we can get access to um, more land. But anyway, we have these economic, social, and ecological goals that all kind of merge together, and we need an equitable, livable, and viable type system. And we feel like we're making that here. So here's a layout of our farm. The red area is kind of what we call our base farm or home farm. Um, it started out as a um, field, a corn field and CRP, and then we've, we've planted it to perennial forages and do a rotational grazing system with a central lane. Um, that connects all the center paddocks to water source. And then we bought 80 acres of woods that we thin to a 10 to 20% canopy and are making a silva pasture. So the goats are most valuable for us in turning all that brush that, ex that just exploded after we did the forestry thinning um, into meat that we can sell and pays for fencing and all of the other uh, infrastructure that we need to contain goats in those areas and also improves uh, the land value after um, it's more of a oak savanna silver pasture in the future. We do have winter housing. We're in Wisconsin. So right now all of our animals are in winter housing. This is different than Jake. Jake has goats out um, in another state and um, some actually still out browsing to girdle plants this time of year. Um, and ours are just in small lots by our barn, um, does not take much space at all to overwinter goats. And um, we feed them outside. They have bedding inside the barn and um, we keep our kids separate from the adult does because if it gets really, if the does get wet and they go into the bedded barn area, they can crush kids. So we keep them separate. But um, really the overwintering part is very, small footprint relative to um, the acreage that you can have them impacting during the growing season. And for somebody who doesn't have access to land that they own or can get a mortgage on, it's easy to overwinter or house them in a place that you don't even own and then use them during the growing season and not even have them in a barn area. So our silo pasture, um, will, the red area is fenced in already. The green areas are um, going to be fences in the future. And that's how we're going to be rotationally grazing in the future. Currently, these past years, we have not been rotationally grazing that red area. We've pretty much been set stocking and letting um, the goats eat what's there wherever they want in that area um, because it's so full of treetops that it's almost impossible to get electronet fences through there to rotation graze. 
which we do rotationally graze on the home farm, just not in a silo pasture right now. And once it's more open, then we can do more rotational grazing there and browsing. So we do different things by season. In spring, we're selling like right now, we're still selling late finishing kids. Um, by May and June, we're kidding on pasture. We just pulled the bucks out of our um, doe herds for breeding uh, three days ago. Um, we keep our bucks with stallions. So we also have a rotationally grazed mare herd that um, foals on pasture. It's kind of like a cow calf herd, but they're horses instead of um, beef. And we um, co-graze a lot of our different species on the farm, including sticking the bucks with um, the stallions uh, in the spring and over winter. Uh, we do cull does after um, kidding, which is in May. And the ones that are bad mothers aren't a drag on our system. They get culled out and sent to auction at that time. In summer, uh, by mid-June, the kids are done being born on pasture. And then we move everybody to the silo pasture. That's set stocked for now. Um, the bucks are eating weeds in our sacrifice lots. Those sacrifice lots are what the animals lived in over the winter. And so they're all beat up and full of extra nutrients and growing lots of weeds. Um, so they make good use of that, those weeds. Um, and we do rotate them there, but we also are testing them for parasite resistance by running them through areas that are heavily parasitized. We also, during the summer, are making hay or baleage and doing our forage testing. We primarily feed baleage to the goats during winter because we can put up better quality, more consistent, better quality uh, feed for our goats as baleage than we can as dry hay. Just last summer was different with it being as dry as it was and we got more dry hay put up, but that's weird, at least for this area. In fall, um, by late September, the does are um, evaluated. We've put them in winter quarters. We've sold off culls, inventory kids, weaned, um, managing them in separate quarters and feeding them different quality of feed than the adult does get. Um, we identify bucklings for being uh, retained as potential breeding stock and breeding sales or meat sales. And then we stick the bucks back um, with the mare herd. During the winter, the um, does are split um, and we put them with the bucks that we want them bred to. And so it's in December that we breed. So that we're kidding in May and June on pasture. And then mid-January, those does are recombined, put in with a cleanup buck to make sure that everybody at least gets the bread. Um, and then sale of kids for meat starts. And um, generally our management is um, we don't feed any grain, even for flushing. We don't, um, we want to feed everything on forage that we can produce here, either harvested forages or the goats harvesting their own in the silver pasture or other brushy areas. Um, we feed a higher uh, forage quality for kids and a lower uh, forage quality for the bucks. And um, we don't want flushing, we want genetic twinning, so we select for that. We intentionally contaminate our, our paddocks and expose our goats to those contaminated paddocks of parasites so that we know which ones have natural resistance to the parasites. We don't use kidding jugs or any kind of infrastructure for, um, for kidding. The does have to be good mothers. They have to take care of their kids. They have to not abandon them. They have to have sufficient milk and quality udders and be able to get around. And um, we keep them in a three-sided open barn with straw bedding and a mineral buffet provided during the winter. Uh, they don't have heated anything. Um, they eat outside during the winter even. So um, they have to have good cashmere and good coats to be able to handle that. In the summer, they don't have any shelter at all. They have um, brush as their shelter. Um, I guess that is their shelter. They just don't have any man-made shelter. Uh, when kids are born, we tag them, we weigh them. Uh, some, if they're out of does or the doe had trouble, we will castrate them right then. Um, and we inventory everything in the first day of life so that we can calculate average daily gains and um, percent of the doe of weaning and um, mothering abilities and that sort of thing. Um, we can do fecal counts for matcha, body condition scoring, utter quality, mothering ability, health issues, and all that recorded by ear tag. All of our does have they're scrapey ear tags, and we use those. Um, and then um, if we have culls, we, we always have culls. So the, the culls are fed up on high quality forage. They're treated for whatever ailments they have. Um, if they need to be dewormed, they're dumping parasites in a sacrifice lot instead of on our good pasture to 
avoid all those uh, resistant parasites being dumped out there and then they're sold for meat. We won't sell anything that we wouldn't keep ourselves for um, breeding. So in spring, um, move this here. Um, we have the kidding and the sacrifice um, paddock vegetation. Uh, we do have sheep too. So we um, rotationally use our sheep and our lawn to mow our lawn for us. So we minimize actual um, mowing with a um, lawn mower and um, kidding in the brush and culling um, those that are not so great. There you go. Summer, um, we, this is the type of vegetation that the does are in on the left. So they're in dense, very diverse vegetation of all the woody and, and um, undergrowth species that explode when, they, when light hits the ground after thinning a forest canopy. On the right is um, the buck herd and our rams that live with our mare herd on pasture and they get rotated around together and all these groups have livestock guardian dogs with them too. And we're doing our forage testing at that time. So one thing that we do look at is um, the average daily gain that our goats um, are able to accomplish. And for my master's degree, I studied um, using goats for brush control at the Yellowstone Lake Wildlife Area in Blanchardville, Wisconsin. And we had three different herds of goats that were used for that. And they um, were all owned by different people. Our herd was one of them. But as you can see here, there's a variety of different um, average daily gain um, in pounds per day of um, these various classes of goats. So the first um, first class here is kids and they, the B or K is boar or Kiko and M is myotonic. Um, so that gives you a breakdown of number of individuals by breed and by class of goat and then what their average daily gains were um, on those brush filled sites where 90% of their diet was uh, brush. They, they, there was pretty much no grass there, very minimal grass, a bit of forbs, but primarily brush. And um, the best um, performing ones were um, getting 0.316 pounds of weight per day in that brush. And um, the lower ones were ones that we actually had in our herd, which had myotonic mixed into them and they were getting 0.18, so 0.2 pounds per day average daily gain. So this is what's possible in Wisconsin with no kind of no grain supplementation, goats that are adapted to eating uh, brush and um, what grows here in the state. So um, we use these as benchmarks. And then um, the other classes of goats were just part of the um, research project to get an assessment of how they did. And they all did very well. So in the summer, um, here you can see we feed uh, free choice minerals. And we use these beef mineral feeders. And we park them up near the water for the goats. Um, this is in our silver pasture. And Pallet thing to the right is the livestock guardian dog feeding station to keep the goats out of the dog food. Um, but the goats come up to this corner of the silva pasture a couple times a day to get mineral water, uh, rest in the shade, and then head back out to graze and browse some more. In the fall, goats are um, eating brush still um, and then brought in. The bucks are out in the pasture. Um, they get brought in uh, when the mares come in from the pasture and um, that's when we do our, our weighing of average day and calculating of average daily gain on the, the um, doelings and bucklings that were produced that year and use that to evaluate the does and sires that produce them. Uh, in the fall, um, I got a SARE grant to study portable livestock shelters. So I built um, hoop houses on boat trailers, $150 uh, used boat trailers with a hoop house on them and silage plastic over the top of the stock panels that make the hoop. And that works great for goat shelters and it can be hauled down the highway. Um, so those are very portable and um, don't require a lot of money or um, having expensive infrastructure and can be moved between properties very easily. And the goats do great um, in these shelters. They go under them and in them. They don't like the double deck as much in terms of being up on that double deck as I thought they would, but um, they like the enclosed space of the double deck. And then we have the mineral feeders moved into there and 
uh, fed in um, bale feeders during the winter. And we finally this year got, I would say, a really functional uh, handling system. We've had um, parts of handling systems in the past, and it's a huge difference as the, the herd has grown to have a um, better handling system. And um, even though we, we put it together with three different um, systems, as you can see by the different colors and styles here in this lineup, um, it still works. And we even have like pallets and other things we could eventually replace with real gates. But handling systems sure make life easier than trying to grab and catch and weigh and all that sort of thing without them. Um, in the winter, our goats are outside, um, eating outside. Uh, they use the shelters. We have guard dogs living with them and the dogs live in the shelters with them. Uh, we also have that open-sided barn that they can go in. The bucks um, on the right live with our stallions. So we typically have four to six stallions at any one time and they all get along just fine and they all eat outside and um, live together and that works well. Uh, winter breeding, and that's the main thing we're doing during the winter and selling uh, bucklings and uh, cull does and things like that. So we separate uh, goats into groups and um, assign them to certain bucks and let them breed. And then um, feeding again in the winter is these um, collapsible bale um, feeders that slide in as the bale gets eaten and um, primarily just feeding round bales of baleage. Um, sometimes we'll offer dry hay, but primarily it's um, forage quality tested to find out, um, to make sure that it's the type of forage that meets the, the needs of the particular goats that we have and then just setting these up and filling them once a week. We, we prefer to only have to feed once a week. We don't go out there daily, which is nice without, without grain feeding. We're not out there daily or twice daily having to provide feed and get trampled. Um, so again, in winter, we have these um, various types of um, mineral feeders for our uh, mineral system. Um, with about 250 goats, it's about $700 worth of mineral that we go through every year. And um, that's in the second year, it was half the amount that they went through in the first year with the cafeteria style. So they definitely got mineralized and haven't been um, eating near as much in the second year. But um, this system has worked really well for all of our livestock, horses, goats, sheep, we can all keep them together and have the same mineral source. So um, we, have gen we have criteria for the selection of our, um, our animals that we keep and those that we cull. So um, for us, they need to be resistant to parasites. They need to thrive and pr produce really good body condition with, um, without grain or extra energy supplements. They need to do it on what we can put up for forage uh, for winter and on what grows in our silver pasture during the summer. We need does that settle on their first cover. Uh, we want does that twin um, without flushing, so genetic twinning. We want does that don't need any assistance kidding, being good mothers. Um, they want to, we need them to lactate on 100% forage diets, so without extra um, energy to feed at least twins, sometimes triplets. Uh, they need to have good udders and hooves. We don't like hoof trimming, so we get rid of the ones that have bad hoof structure. Uh, raising their kids in the silo pasture. We like the, kind of the same thing as you, what we select for in beef uh, in terms of efficient beef phenotype, which is a deep body, short legs, broad back, and uh, functional mouth. And those that don't lose their kids too out in the silo pasture is important. Um, they can't lose too much body condition. I mean, those always will lose some body condition while lactating, but on a brush diet, it's restricted in energy. So those that are, have been raised on high grain diets don't really perform very well in um, a brush-based diet because it's um, high in protein, but generally restricted in energy source. Um, so we need them to regain their body condition on forage uh, when we bring them back in up to the pasture and wean their kids off of them. We use 35 inch electronet fences, so they have to stay in that. Um, they have to adjust from a complete diverse pasture forage diet on brush to 
stored winter forages that are just the same thing as what people put up for cattle in this area. So that's quite an adjustment for an animal to do. Um, but ours, we expect them to do that and do it well uh, if they stay in our system. We like cashmere because that allows them to be warm during the winter and shed it in the spring. Uh, we need to uh, and do it on their own. They, don't, they need to be able to, um, if they have a health issue and there's minerals available to fix that, they, they need to be able to do that on their own. We, they've done that. Um, they need to also pass their good traits onto their offspring. It's amazing how many times we've had what I've considered really good goats, but they just don't produce good offspring. And so we get rid of those. And they need to have kids that are marketable at um, six to 10 months, but ideally even at four months ready to go. We're, we're getting that now. Um, they also need to be not aggressive with humans and not high strung. They need to stay, stay in our fences and be manageable, not jump out of our handling systems when we're trying to um, put them through the, the systems. So part of this that um, I don't see a lot of other goat folks doing is forage testing. And um, that's so important to know when you're selecting for goats that are more metabolically efficient, uh, you have to know what you're feeding them to understand what um, the best ones in the herd are able to um, process versus the lowest quality ones in the herd. And by doing forage testing and um, getting a complete analysis that includes relative forage quality, the RFQ, instead of just relative forage uh, feed value, RFV, which is the more common reported um, metric for uh, most forage analyses. Um, use the RFQ, that's what we do. Um, and this chart um, is adapted from Dr. Understander at UW-Madison who um, designed this RFQ metric for forage quality and um, different classes of different types of livestock are in um, this chart showing different forage qualities for uh, meeting their needs. Now, we have goats uh, and horses that are outside of what you would see in, these, in this chart, but that's because um, we've selected them for that or they're just naturally very metabolically efficient animals. For us, our um, meat does over winter do really well on 150 RFQ. The kids um, get around 170 RFQ. The bucks need lower quality, so 100 to 130 RFQ. To put that in um, context, when you have dairy goats, um, they, they need much higher quality if you're just doing forage-based diets. So 160 to 180, up to 230, 250 RFQ, if you can get that, if you're trying to have dairy goats without any kind of grain in the diet. So to test um, what your herd needs, you look at what um, your goats are performing on. Are they um, keeping weight? If they're keeping weight on no grain and whatever forage you're feeding, test that forage and find out what the RFQ is and um, use that as your benchmark for buying more hay in the future, more forage in the future. And um, also use that to determine what you want to feed to your, your herd. So if you have a dairy herd and um, they require really expensive 200 plus RFQ forage uh, to keep them in good body condition and you wanna move to something that costs less and is more available to buy, um, select the individuals that are, are actually fat on that um, level of forage quality and start feeding them a lower forage quality and see what they, what as low as you can go while they still maintain good body condition and health. So that's what we do with our herd for selecting uh, metabolically efficient goats. So um, where to get good genetics uh, for goats, there's um, lots of farms out there that have similar uh, selection criteria as what we have. Um, you generally want goats that have not been babied and stuff that has been multiple generations in the same environment that you live in is more likely to be adapted to your farm um, and those same growing conditions than something from a long distance. That being said, I've gotten some really great goats from Kansas um, and I've struggled more with getting goats from Eastern states, which I uh, didn't think would work. I, I thought it would be the opposite. I thought the Eastern goats would be better adapted for Wisconsin than 
the central state goats, but um, it might just be the, the system that they were raised in. But we've bought goats from all over the country. Um, so generally, if you're wanting to have a low input system where you're just um, feeding what grows in the landscape, you don't want to buy goats from places that have been using high grain inputs or um, places that have been babying the goats with um, lots of feed and, and uh, lots of interventions to keep them healthy and alive. And um, you also want goats that maintain good body condition and aren't programmed to just pump all of their energy into milk production, which is what most commercial dairy goats have. You can raise dairy goats on uh, forage alone, but you probably have to supplement them if you're, they're in a brushy situation with a high energy content grass and have more uh, high quality forage over winter. And so within your herd, you can have individuals that are not um, exactly what you want. You can baby them a little bit and breed them to something that has better traits and breed up and select individuals along the way that meet your criteria. Um, so, you, and often buying goats is just kind of a, um, you, you never know what you're going to get and you never know which ones are going to work out. Um, we don't have any papered goats anymore. Um, I have a whole binder of papers that doesn't mean anything anymore because um, we just, we cull too hard. And so we don't register anything and we keep everything just that will perform and we don't care um, what its um, pedigree is other than uh, we keep it, we pay attention to who's bred to who for uh, ensuring that we aren't doing too close a line breeding or inbreeding to avoid inbreeding depression. And generally bringing in a good buck is um, better than um, trying to buy a huge group of good does because you're gonna um, be uh, selecting individuals within your herd and um, the, the does are more likely to have um, adaption issues than um, just one good buck that is um, brought into your system. Uh, so predators, we'll talk about predators. Um, there's ways to avoid predators, including fencing, um, livestock guardian dogs, donkeys or llamas, hunting and trapping. Um, we have woven wire around our perimeter um, of our silvopasture and kids, like you can see here, can get their heads stuck in that and that's just waiting for a coyote to come along and eat the, the goat stuck in the fence. Um, we use electrified netting in our uh, rotational grazing pasture, which is what you see here in the upper right. And then uh, fladry is used to keep wolves away. Um, it works for a little while. Uh, it doesn't work against coyotes, as you can see in this picture. But um, coyotes are deterred by something that's been in the environment for um, less than two weeks that's different. So if you move your fences every two weeks, coyotes are you can stay away. Um, here's portable electrified netting. Um, for our goats, as long as it's about 3.5 kilovolts um, or more, they respect that and we can push them to eat all the vegetation within seven feet of the ground and six inches from the ground. Uh, and that electric netting goes all over the place, very easy to set up. Um, here's a picture of setting it up and various fencing array systems. So with seven fences, you can enclose with two paddocks that can be uh, leapfrogged. Um, a, a 0.62 or 5 eighths acre area with um, 170, 164 foot fences. And that can easily in Wisconsin contain 40 to 50 goats per paddock for two to five days for them to defoliate what's in there. And it takes about one to two hours to set up. Um, there's also, you can easily set that, those same things up with a five foot, five foot system, five fence system, sorry, that um, contains 10 to 12 uh, goats per paddock and it only takes two to five days for them to defoliate that um, with that number in that area of 0.15 acres and um, a half hour to an hour to set that up. Um, we prefer to use livestock guardian dogs um, for predator control. Um, even though our fences are not left in place for uh, longer than two weeks and coyotes are our primary predator, uh, there are other predators that, like aerial predators, that can be a problem, so we don't mess around. We just keep dogs with everything that works well for us. Um, we've had donkeys, and I've uh, 
managed a herd with a llama in the past. And as you can see, the, the donkey in this picture um, is obese because uh, donkeys managed with goats to manage the quality of forage that the goats need. It's going to be too high a quality of forage for the donkey. So the donkey's going to get fat. Llamas are, are better um, in terms of matching the forage quality. Uh, but the, both species can be more challenging and um, a bit unpredictable. There are dogs too that can be a problem, but um, most good dogs will work. Um, hunting and trapping is an option too. I'm a certified hunter and trapper with the Wisconsin DNR, and um, we don't trap or shoot um, coyotes around us because a stable predator population around our farm keeps um, young coyotes and young um, naive animals from uh, being a problem for our livestock. The older ones that are trained to our livestock and our perimeters are much better. And also if you reduce coyote populations as it was shown in this graph, they just respond with larger litters. So it's an unending um, need to be reducing the population as the, the coyotes are reproduce, reproducing. So we don't bother with that. Um, pasture um, parasite levels is always a question people have. Well, if I rotationally graze and do a good job of um, grazing management, um, how often till I can rotate back into that paddock? Well, in Wisconsin, we have barber pole worms that survive over winter and um, there will be in, um, plenty of parasites that even within one grazing season, unless you hay the ground or otherwise dry it out, there's going to be contamination in a paddock that you grazed earlier that year. Um, so all of the rotational grazing stuff that we wanna do, um, the things will help with, with um, parasite management, but they're not a way to avoid parasites um, on pasture. People are always asking about stocking rates and stocking density. Um, so how many goats per acre for the entire season or how many goats in a particular area for a short period of time. And so the stocking rate is the whole season view. So normally um, th these uh, data are from various projects I've done research on or studies like in West Virginia or Oklahoma um, that have reported the number of goats per acre for the entire season that are um, placed in, a, in those areas. And so anywhere from uh, four to 10 goats per acre for the entire season. And um, an Oklahoma publication said that um, if you apply one goat per acre per percent brush cover in an area, then that can uh, maintain uh, a low level of brush cover in that area. For our farm, in our silver pasture in 2021, we had 6.7 goats in that set stock silver pasture, um, 30 acres, and it's the second year of goat browsing out there. So it's not quite, it wasn't quite as dense as um, has been in the, the first year of browsing, but um, the area supported without any supplemental feed, 6.7 goats per acre. So that's um, just a kind of a base number. And then stocking density is different than stocking rate. Density is referring to the instantaneous number of goats that you have in an area. So those little rotational grazing paddocks I showed before with um, very small acreage and 10 to 12 goats or uh, 20 some goats, that would be your instantaneous or your stocking density. And so we've had 90 goats per acre, 70 goats per acre, 20 goats per acre, just looking at different stocking densities and impacts on vegetation. And generally we just leave them there until we've seen that they've accomplished the amount of vegetation removal that we want, and then we move them to the next paddock. Um, people will also talk about animal unit equivalents, and um, that's based on the metabolisms of the different classes of goats. So lactating does are gonna have a higher metabolic need. They're gonna to need to consume more feed, more forage value than um, a weather or a buck. And um, kids are even higher than lactating does. And open does are in between all of those. And so we can relate that to um, using those percentages of body weight and dry matter intake um, consumed daily, we can relate any ground that the USDA has identified as um, certain stocking rates of cattle, um, we can relate that back to goats and use that as a benchmark for starting with the stocking rate that we need to put out there of goats. Uh, this is typical what we see um, 
in applying goats for brush control. So uh, these uh, pictures are at the Yellowstone Lake Wildlife Area with my herd down there, um, a 1.5 acre paddock with 110 goats. After three days, they had um, eaten everything green from about three to six inches above the ground to seven feet above the ground. So um, this is the impact that the goats can have in just one uh, flash through an area. And that's a, a fairly large number of goats in a small area for a few days. But it was overall um, not a very um, high stocking rate for the entire property. So some economic considerations. Um, we look at um, for figuring out enterprise budgets and what we're wanting to do with our properties or our time, our interests, uh, what are the sale prices that we can get for the things that we're producing and what does it cost to produce those? So we have feed costs, we have equipment. There's, uh, you can have really extensive equipment with goats or you can have very minimal or anything in between. So it all depends on what you want to do, what you're comfortable with, what you're physically able to do. So part of um, uh, what Jake is gonna be talking about is setting up paddocks in rough terrain on other people's land and um, browsing goats through those areas. And that takes a physical, it's quite a physical job. And um, whereas set stocking and having um, a perimeter fence that the animals stay in all summer is much less physical other than whoever sets up that fence in the first place. Um, generally electric um, can be provided by solar or battery power or wind power. Um, we use batteries in remote uh, locations. We haven't used a solar array yet, but that would be um, the next thing that we would do. Uh, you need to buy, for the winter, um, we typically buy straw for bedding. So that's one of the things that we purchase that we don't raise ourselves, And um, it's not very, doesn't take that much and it's not that expensive. But then we buy minerals. Um, we rent fields for putting up our hay and baleage. And we have um, a hay mower, redder, uh, tedder, and rake, but we don't have a baler. We don't have a wrap, um, a wrapper. So we hire custom work to be done for that. Uh, also spreading um, manure and fertilizer and um, helping transport baleage around from where it's put up to our farm. The livestock guardian dogs need to be fed. Uh, we have licenses in our township that um, they have to have and um, vet care. Uh, and then if you own land, um, thinking about what the mortgage is and, and applying that to um, the production system and then insurance uh, costs for that um, farm system that you have too are, are all things that um, need to be considered as to whether the, the system you're thinking about is going to work for you. And all these things can be different price in different areas. So um, to show some examples of our um, particular area, we have December from 2017, December uh, sales slip and a December 2018 sales slip. And um, this shows some variations in prices. So um, D kid is what's considered a dairy kid and generally dairy kids get lower prices than boar or boar cross kids. And so um, the AVG is the average weight of the goats that were in that um, lot that day. And then the price is per hundred pounds. And so if you just move the decimal place over the left two points, it's like $2.60 a pound for a 57 pound um, crossbred kid. And we, there were 20 head of those crossbred kids in that um, particular shipment. And so that was an average of $132 um, per kid. Whereas the December 2018 sales slip a year later, um, different size, slightly different size kids and different prices ended up with um, almost double the uh, number of kids and like half the price. So um, those kids could have been different body condition. It could have been just the sales day. Um, it could have been both, um, but these prices can be highly variable. And so we have to, when our planning for a um, system that is going to be profitable and risk aversion, we need to think about what the lows and the highs are that we can expect in these kind of systems. So if we apply those um, 
those uh, sale prices of those kids to um, what it looks like in our silvopasture system on our farm. If we have 139 day grazing season, which is May 15th, to October 1st, the kids are born at eight pounds um, in May. By the Christmas sale, which is when a lot of goat kids are sold, they are 50 pounds um, and it's 240 days to get to the Christmas sale from when they were born. They need to, to gain 42 pounds. And so on an average daily gain um, basis, that's 0.3 pounds per day of average daily gain as the target to get um, one of those two sale prices per kid. And for us in our silo pasture, we can host uh, 6.7 goats uh, per acre. So 1.5 of every three goats that are out in the silo pasture are kids. So you have your doe and you have two kids. Um, and so we only have half of half of those goats that are available for sale. So in terms of a dollars per silo pasture acre um, per year of um, gross income, certainly not net, we could have a range from $300 an acre to $400 an acre um, based on those sale prices. And um, so I have some stats from 2022 herd here, also the, the days on baleage being 226. Um, we had 172% kidding uh, rate, which um, means one doe would, would produce 1.72 kids um, per kidding. Ideally, it would be two, um, 200%, so it'd be two kids per doe. But there's always does that have singles. There are some does that have triplets. And um, we're always calling out the does that have singles and, and keeping more of the ones that twin and trying to make sure that the ones that, if they have triplets, that they raise them all or those get, the ones that can't raise them all get culled. Um, our four month brush average daily gain is um, 0.2 to 0.34. So we have a range there and they definitely fall within that target of producing a um, 50 pound Christmas kid, uh, if we wanted to do that. And like I said before, we can put 6.7 goats per acre. Um, we have a fairly high culling percent um, on our, in our herd. And um, I think nationwide, it's supposed to be around 5% is the reported amount of culling or um, uh, losses that goat producers will report, but um, for us, we're we're pretty rigorous in what we select for, and we will um, readily call out 23% of our herd every year to um, ensure that the ones that we keep are meeting our needs. It makes us grow slower, our herd grow slower, but um, it's more profitable. And then we figure from all of our particular costs, it's about $20 per doe per month to maintain her. Here's another example of some sales slips from our herd. Um, the June 2021 sales slip um, showed some culled does that we took to auction and um, they were fairly large size goats, um, but really <laughs> not great uh, body condition. They, they got really good prices in June of 2021. So $223 um, on average per cull doe. But then contrast that to September 2018 when we took a bunch of cull does to auction too. Um, they weren't so different in their weight, uh, but their price was significantly less. So we averaged $38 per cull doe. And so if you're thinking about budgeting, you have to consider these um, price differences that you're um, potentially going to get if you're selling at auction. Now, if you're selling direct sales, um, there's more effort in marketing, but you, you can generally be a little more um, uh, set in the prices that you're going to get. And another sales slip, this is the one that we just got back from uh, yesterday's sale. We um, were getting 440 to 440, $4.55 um, $4 per pound for um, crossbred bucklings that were uh, 50 to 65 pounds. And so the average um, per head uh, income from that those goats in our grain-free system it was $238. That's the highest we've ever gotten for any kind of goats that we've sold. And um, I don't know how long this is going to last, but I'm not budgeting on it. I'm budgeting on much lower, um, lower prices per head and um, in 
the herd projections that I make, like this one that you see below here, um, we write out um, our percent culling because at every stage in the process, we're culling um, goats and we look at the number of head and um, what we have to sell and everything in the yellow box um, can be adjusted for uh, the reality of the situation. But like right in this spreadsheet, I have sale price of $150 per head versus the 283 that um, we just got yesterday. Um, so all of these can be modified in anybody who has a, um, a herd that they want to grow. They can apply their own numbers based on the prior year's um, data to determine um, what they need to do in terms of growing their herd to the size that they want. And if you see here, we are not, right now, we keep pretty much any doling that um, to be added to the herd to grow our herd to 400 does, 400 mature does that are reproducing. And we aren't there yet, but um, because we're retaining all those does and only selling bucklings um, and selling some cull does and some cull bucks and things like that along the way, um, we aren't making huge amounts of money every year, but once 2026 comes around and the herd um, has grown to close to 400 adult does, then we'll be making quite a bit per year. Um, and we won't, because we'll be selling most of those doelings rather as um, either meat or breeding stock for other people. And those prices can um, be changed to uh, reflect the value of how they, they go as meat or as breeding stock. And um, putting a budget together like this that has realistic expectations and numbers and losses and that sort of thing um, is necessary for ensuring that you don't overextend yourself um, when you're planning your, your herd's growth. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, so um, some of the reasons that we feel like we have success in what we're doing here is um, we worked really hard to select genetics that are adaptable, durable, efficient, parasite resistant, so they don't need deworming. Um, and they also produce um, kids that are what the market wants. So fleshy kids. And um, I should have stuck a picture in here of the, the kids that we took to market. They got the $4. But they, they don't look as good as purebred boar goats, but they're plenty fleshy. And so the buyers um, thought they were worth $4 a pound. That's, we're pretty happy with that. Um, doing that forage testing allows us to ensure that we have the forage to meet the needs of the goats that we have and the needs of the goats that we want to produce in the future. So it allows us to select for that. Um, having forage diversity provides a huge amount of benefit to animals, especially when they're um, out in the silvopasture during the summer, they're eating a big diversity of plants. Also, we our hay ground, we intentionally plant a lot of different species of forages in our hay ground. And then we harvest that as um, their hay or baleage and feed that over winter. So there, it's not just orchard grass um, or just alfalfa in what we're feeding our goats over winter. That, that diversity makes a big difference. We try to minimize stress, even though um, there's the reality of stress of living in Wisconsin and negative whatever um, <laughs> for most of the winter, uh, crunchy snow and, and frozen toes. But um, other stresses like keeping the animals out of ammonia. Um, so keeping them out of barns that are full of ammonia where you're gonna get um, pneumonia issues um, in animals that are exposed to a lot of, or of um, ammonia. Uh, also matching the seasons to the critical periods of um, the animal's production system. So goats have a higher need for energy when they're lactating. And right after they give birth, shortly after that, they're gonna have a peak lactation. Um, and that is when they need to have the best quality forage. So we match that lactation peak with uh, spring growth of pasture. So in May and June, the goats are out on pasture giving birth and eating really high quality food. And then they're moved into the silo pasture for the summer once the kids are um, between 15 days and, and 30 days old. We also cull hard, um, we graze and browse um, in a managed way and uh, with intentional exposure to parasites or intentional avoidance of parasites, depending on 
um, what we're doing with the particular goats. Um, when we grow the herd, we want to recognize health issues and avoid um, individuals that have health issues. We also have to um, be successful at uh, managing those health conditions in an economically viable manner. So um, sometimes learning some of the skills rather than having the veterinarian come out to do everything um, with your goats is a way to be successful. And that's what, what we do. Um, the mineral um, and vitamin buffet we feel has been very important for our success. Uh, as we're getting older, having good um, handling equipment, sorting equipment is really nice. Um, we used to just grab goats and pull them where we needed them to go and our bodies just can't do that anymore. Um, you also have to be knowledgeable enough to try something unique, which is what we've been doing here and what we're trying to help other people um, do and avoid the pitfalls that we've had. Um, and having good credit so that you can afford, if you have a bad year, to um, not lose everything. Um, working to pay bills off, keeping a job that um, ensures that you can pay all your bills is, is really important. Hey, Sherry, just as we get into this next slide and stuff here, we're pushing up on seven o'clock and I want to make sure we have time for both Jake and uh, questions and stuff. So, sorry, so, this is fantastic I'm information. Almost, almost <laughs> done here. So cool. there are definitely some risks and like here, one of my goats um, in a thunderstorm, a branch came down on an oak tree and um, they were clustered under the oak and this one was in the wrong place, got crushed. Things like this happen, but um, also, these prices are really high right now. We don't know exactly why, other than fires out in Australia reducing supply um, that's normally shipped into this country. But most of the time, these goats are not eaten by the majority of Americans. Um, so that has a direct marketing limitation and value added limitation. Um, even though we could do organic certification, we're not because there's no premium for it. If there was a premium for organic goat, we'd be certified. Um, there is a learning, learning curve to being successful with goats and a lot of beef farmers or sheep farmers really don't like goats because they think they're too hard or whatever. Um, so to do that learning curve in a, um, low risk manner, start small. Don't just go buy a big herd of goats and um, you could lose a lot of them really fast that way. Um, and then marketing at the right times is important and having the good body condition that um, is needed. So some resources, there's a bunch of Facebook groups out there. If you want to find goats that are like what we produce, HireGoats.com has all of the, the targeted grazing and um, goat contractor businesses located on their page, and they all have goats that have similar selection pressures as the herd that we have. Um, Society for Range Management has uh, this targeted grazing book, which is really good. I would encourage everybody to get that. The American Sheep Industry is um, part of what produced that. And then um, Building a Sustainable Business book is really good. The Goat Rancher Magazine and um, our our uh, friends here with all of their amazing resources on their website for um, SFA and sort of some references for you for the presentation and then um, any questions, I'm happy to answer them at the end of this talk or later um, as you come to them. And that's my email and phone number. Yeah, oh, there's a bunch of questions. So we'll definitely have, hopefully you got time <laughs> later. Um, that was fantastic, lots of good information, yeah. um, but, Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to Jake just so we can um, have him start sharing. And uh, the the plan time for this was to be over at 730. I'm hoping uh, if, if you're still able to hang out past 730, um, we can get to some of those questions after Jake's presentation and anyone who wants can jump off. But then uh, then uh, you're able to stick on. Um, awesome. Just got to Get Jake, awesome, you're muted, Jake, but whenever you're ready, I'll let you take over. Hi, uh, just a, a quick uh, quick intro. Glad to be on with Sherry here. She was one uh, when I started this about eight years ago, kind of a early person I reached out to and uh, was an early cheerleader back when uh, this was just kind of get going and uh, I'm, it's uh, great to be with her on this. So, so what I have here is our uh, family this year. 
And um, yeah, I'm just gonna start going through the slides and we'll do questions at the end. All right, and hopefully it's showing up full screen here, but this was the early, early, this is the first goat dispatch pen. Uh, borrowed some goats from a neighbor. Wife wanted to always have goats. I took a picture from a tree stand. And yeah, uh, this is actually from a, a high school friend. Threw them out there, saw what they would do, threw up some cattle panels. And little did I know what it would grow into after, after this picture. So that first year, a lot of people here might just be starting or thinking about getting into goats. So I was like, hey, that went really well. The goats ate the buckthorn well. Um, I'm gonna go buy some more goats. So I went to my local auction, bought some of these goats here. Put them in enet in the winter time and uh it was pretty much a disaster uh these just kind of you know just so very green i don't have have a lot of agriculture in my family most corn and soybean but not a lot of livestock and nobody i knew raised goats in any kind of way i was hoping to raise them so they were getting out all the time and uh it was just kind of a, a complete mess and uh so what i started to do is put some cattle panels up and kind of and went away from the enet really early in the beginning and just started uh, putting them in trees. But the way my land works, most of my land, the 10 acres is almost entirely wooded. So um, they really didn't have a choice. They're gonna be in the trees whether they like it or not. So it was uh, kind of cutting down trees, throwing uh, brush samplings into them. And here's one of our uh, beloved, uh, we called her Black Betty. Uh, she taught us a lot. And that's kind of how it kind of started out. She taught me a lot. I I learned a lot from her, but this was an early spring one day early on. And I was just, this is a buckthorn plant in the pen. And I was like, whoa, what are you doing here? This is pretty cool. So just kind of sitting back and watching what the goats would tell me. And it was really cool to see her chewing on the bark of this buckthorn plant. And I'll be talking, I'll probably talk about bark stripping a lot because that's kind of where I've been putting most of my energy and the most excitement that I find with the goats and what they can do. But, um, this presentation, just to back up, this is a, some of the pictures that I've taken recently. I'm trying to keep stuff current and also stuff that I've had over, over time. But uh, yeah, just uh, this is kind of a mix of stuff going on here just to talk about the different concepts. And this is a, I, um, a couple years ago, but another goat highlighting eating some taller buckthorn because uh, a lot of people try to, try to give people different tracks as far as uh, what they can do to manage their woodlands, especially buckthorn in Minnesota. So the, the particular uh, train of thought, and it still is today, and, and I'm not gonna lie, I mean, there's certain areas that a bobcat can come in with a rotary forestry head and just totally grind things up pretty quickly. But also there are areas that, um, just showing that, that there is hope and an option, because this is about a four or five inch buckthorn that was way taller than they can impact. But when, once the goats strip this bark and then it respread it at the base, uh, it just totally opens the game to what you can do with goats and not always need machinery on every situation. And this is another area here that kind of opened my eyes. This is honeysuckle. Um, I think there's about a 30 or 40 acre site, but it, you can just see all the light bark uh, stripping going on in here. This was at a, a pretty remote uh, park, uh, really hilly. And uh, it's just really cool to see, you know, I, yeah, I could come in here and I could defoliate this a couple times a summer or kind of the current rotation, but just one early spring uh, for a couple weeks. And we can totally take that plant down and they're crispy at the top when you can get that kind of, uh, of and then also it's kind of hard to tell in the background here, but there's a lot of bur oaks mixed in with this. And it's just really cool how that thick bark, they just kind of gravitate away from that. So they're just really taking out the species that we're going for, the, the buckthorn, the honeysuckle, the prickly ash, and leaving a lot of the desirable trees. Then just doing lots of random weird, cool stuff. So some goats I leave up here, some goats as uh, Sherry mentioned, I, I've been sending to Kansas the last couple of years, kind of did some numbers on that and was finding that, uh, yeah, uh, middle of nowhere, Kansas. Uh, they don't really grow a lot of corn or soybeans down there. So there's not a lot of pressure per acre to uh, plant that type of stuff. So we're finding that hay was uh, cheaper down there. And even with transporting costs, uh, I've got a really good friend, kind of a partner down there that we kind of work together. And uh, so the moms and the babies get an all-inclusive uh, winter vacation paid for by goat dispatch. And then the, the bucks and the weathers get to huff it out with me in the wintertime here. Uh, 
Um, here's another area that uh, kind of proud of. This is what a couple of years ago, about a 230 acre pen that we uh, tried to, that we fenced in a lot of different zones, but we, we, we had one fence that did this whole area. You kind of went off a, a stream that didn't freeze in the winter. So that was helping to with one side, but just the area and really trying to put this to scale because I, when I first kind of got into this in the state, a lot of grumbling like oh bucks aren't don't even worry about it, don't even try about it. a lot of people are giving up on it so just really showing that there's a a way to make this a big thing and also to do not just uh an acre here an acre there kind of kind of deal here's uh me doing a little bit of experimenting out in the winter time kind of keeping the goats uh in uh good shape and moving them around from different uh, zone to zone I use our uh, uh, border collie dogs um to move them kind of around this is kind of just kind of crossing a Arctic tundra soybean field. Yeah, and then just kind of talking like Sherry talked a little bit. I'm glad she talked more about the numbers because I'm definitely don't like numbers and uh, much more of a picture guy and kind of figured out, but it's good to have people taking good data. But this is kind of the data for, for me. This kind of goat is the one I like. Uh, this was back when we had the polar vortex a couple of years ago, but just going out on you know, even having access to different shelter opportunities, yet this goat's still cool, just chilling outside and you can see the frost build up inside the hair and still, uh, I'm gonna say that they're happy, but also that they're they're not dying, I guess at that, uh, you know, regard. And then it's kind of wait and they really know how to catch that early morning sun and try to heat themselves up. Every, every goat in our herd has a name and an actual personal name. Uh, we used to just do one letter. Now we're actually doing two lines because we're running out of names as our phone number. So if they get out, sometimes people can figure out that our phone number is right there. Sometimes the police can figure it out or sometimes not, but just having all that information right there. And then also keeping track of each individual goat, having them on an app on my phone. I, I use Goatbook. Um, there's a lot of other ones out there. I'm not saying that's the best one, but just allows me to look up a goat on my phone and you know see who the mom was, who the dad was, see, I put notes if they're kind of a pain or all that kind of stuff. So we have a lot of different herds within herds just by keeping track of, of that level. And it makes it really easy for the crew and people on a job to say, hey, milkshake's having some problems or milkshake's doing cool. I really love milkshake, that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, this is kind of the winter time. Sometimes we check stuff on snowmobile and have to wear snowmobile helmets and stuff like that. We get pretty cold, but just trying to adapt yourself to be able to get them out on the land. And so you can see in the background, I have a bale, kind of doing some bale grazing out in the middle of a field and, and uh, just letting them get some, have access to browse, have access to hay, have all different kinds of access and let the goats kind of see what they want at a particular time of year. Uh, this is me, it's the same area, just using a snowmobile, but able to move them around. Uh, that's one thing with goats, they kind of like to kind of follow trails and they don't really like to kind of go off in deeper snow, but driving around in the snowmobile and can, can get them to follow me by uh, shaking some treats or whatever, but just being able to move them that way is what that picture is about. Also, this, uh, this little contraption, it's called a snow dog. Um, it's like a track machine that I, if stuff really, you know, we can't get, can't get uh, trucks in there, snowmobiles even getting stuck or whatever. I throw this in the truck and, and just kind of ride along and it, it kind of pulls me along and I can bring supplies or check on goats or check fence. Just having plan A, B, C, or D when you're dealing with the elements in the winter time. And when everything else doesn't start, your horse always will start if you need to check on stuff. So uh, yeah, this is a cold day, just checking on some stuff. So having that option as well. This is a little bit of done when I when I used to uh, keep my kids up here. Did a little bit of kind of putting the bales out there, keeping the same size class. So I I don't like to put like mixed adults or with kids, but uh, you know uh, this method seemed to work pretty well. They kind of ate both sides. Never really had them uh, you know collapse or fall on 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 uh, on the actual goats themselves. They eat in, in the each side out. Also leaving the wrapping on there kind of kept them from climbing on it and peeing and pooping on it and stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, this uh, this method has uh, worked well if you, you don't want to do a little bit of the waste, but that's one thing goats are known for is a little bit of waste. But if you're trying to build soil, you don't always worry about that too much. And this is a, a liquid protein like supplement that we uh, offer at certain times of year or certain individuals that really like this. Uh, my buddy in Kansas kind of turned me on to this. It's just, uh, I, what I like about it is it doesn't freeze and uh, you can kind of just mix it up 
um, when you get some water and stuff in there. And uh, it, it's taken the animals a while to like uh, get adapted to it or just kind of like it. And now they're, I feel the consumption every year is getting better. And uh, yeah, so this is another nice thing to make sure I cover all my bases out there and giving them uh, different uh, feed sources and let them decide what they need. Here's a little shot of some of the shelters that we use in the wintertime. I like calf huts, uh, particularly like they make a half size calf hut. Um, so it's not the full size. It doesn't have the holes for all the milking and stuff because we're not feeding calves out of these kind of things and they're easier to move around but putting that out there um but also just showing having certain goats even though they have these these shelters aren't full but there's still ones that just are hey it's a snowstorm i'm still okay with standing outside and i try to keep track of that a lot of it is just kind of knowing each goat by their name and and uh ones that are a little bit tougher and ones that uh you know, are really uh, jumping in, in for the shelter. And there's also ones that kind of stay in the shelter longer in the day when it's colder and the ones that kind of get up a little bit earlier. So I kind of kind of keep track of all that. This is uh, another way we kind of winter. This is some really big, thick grove of cedar trees. I trimmed them up, put some bedding down. And uh, yeah, just like to really move the areas around when I first started. Um, uh, if I, I start to have, I'd have to do more uh, like water treatments, had more problems with coccidia, but the more I get them out of the land and kind of move their home base around or also trim up some of these trees, it uh, just gives them uh, a, a good place to be. And, I, and on bigger sites, I, I like to kind of follow their lead because they kind of, they, they know where to be. Um, when the sun, they, they find a, a place that's out of the prevailing winds that catches some morning sun and, and just try to play off of that. So like, this was a spot that they kept bedding down. I'm like, okay, I'll limit up. I'll give you a little extra love when, the, when it's super cold here, below zero, I'll give them a little bedding and uh, kind of work off of that. And this is that same site, just kind of, and while they're working on that, again, stripping more bark. And this had a, 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 a trout stream that never froze all winter long on the bottom of the hill. Um, that was one thing I just kind of wanted to talk about. Um, just, yeah, just giving them different options. And despite having, uh, um, for I think I was on this project for four years and they had this open water access on the bottom of the slope the whole time. And in the winter time, they liked to be on the high slope and they very, very rarely walked all the way down to drink liquid water, uh, actually preferring to eat snow. Um, and that's one thing you kind of got to watch, but there's, we've had had uh, good success with them eating snow um don't talk about that on facebook too much you get a lot of groups coming at you or whatever but uh just uh just gotta watch it the one time you do want to watch it is like this period when you're coming out of spring or going into fall when there is no snow yet things are freezing so this is an area where it chips some holes and some ice so they can still get water but uh just uh something to consider um and again i uh, i would start i wouldn't I would say just everyone go home and throw your animals out on snow like definitely kind of watch them and see if they're eating and see how they're doing in their condition and certain goats like ours that have been used to being on the land can probably handle that a little bit more versus other type of goats that maybe be babied or used to a heated water or something like that this is not the same site uh i really like this if you can kind of find some forest clearing areas this is uh, my goats have done some of the best they've ever done when you can get in some of these situations because a lot of companies are coming in cutting a lot of these big brush and trees down they're pushing them in piles and burning them but while they're all laying down and all every in disarray the goats are just jumping on them eating all those tender tips eating the berries stripping the bark and uh, just really good food source and here's again kind of another example of that and then again same site all these trees kind of falling over and they're just going they eat all the tender tips off and then they kind of go for the tender tender bark while they're moving around and it's just really good food and you know i figured hey why not why not and, and use this on your property or your you know wherever you're if you're getting goats in your backyard or and this is the technique i use on my site on my own property is cut a few trees down let them eat the tender tips let them eat the bark let them open it up and then you can go in there with a the chainsaw and then cut out the bigger pieces say if you want firewood what i do is i don't burn firewood i just call my neighbors who burn firewood and they're more than happy to come over because you know my woods is already opened up these trees are already kind of cleaned up they just come in and cut them and they're out of my way and uh it works out really well and this is kind of a, a site in the city so we do a lot of stuff urban all the way from like a, an eighth of an acre in the twin cities metro area all the way up to like that other site that i called a 230 acre 
area out in rural area, but uh, what we've had to do is put up two fences along busy trails and just kind of finding a way to work with people and nature. There's definitely higher stress here. Would not recommend just jumping right out of the gate to go to this. Definitely practice on your house or your neighbor's properties first before you're going in the middle of the city. Because uh, anytime you mix, the more variables you mix in, the more things that can happen. But uh, we've had a really good success uh, with this method. And again, just you know, highlighting the 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 beauty. I don't know. I shouldn't be saying that, but of buckthorn and a lot of these invasive plants that are still green, way way late, even after some snows, and just the nutritional value that we can get from going after these plants and uh, really good feed value versus say. Uh, chemical sprays or that type of stuff, at least for converting all of this into a, a commodity such as food, fiber, or wool, or what have you. And yeah, this is some buckthorn that I've cut down. I don't remember how many years, that was probably two or three years old. Let re sprouts come up and let the goats keep eating the re sprouts. And there, this plant maybe show a leaf, shows a leaf or two, but after a while, it's pretty much, pretty much uh, done. And uh, most of these, I, it's pretty hard to go around my property to find ones that I still feel are really in, any more viable um, and without chemical option, without using chemicals. And this is another thing too, just kind of some other different stumps or trees. After you cut it down, then you get the re-sprouts, they eat the re-sprouts. If you're a little bit late, don't really worry about it. Don't stress about it because the goats can still come and strip the bark of the re-sprout. Yeah, so again, just more bark stripping here going on of uh, re-sprouted plants. So that's why I don't really fret or worry in the state. You know, if uh, everyone wants to keep cutting and uh, um, and uh, let, you know, stuff re-sprout or treat or whatever, like whatever, I'll, I'll just get grazing them in the winter, two or three or four years from now and try to reset it and save it anyway. So um, yeah, so it's not, uh, I'm not too worried about brush, uh, certain species of brush, I guess, uh, especially with uh, how well the goats are doing. Again, honeysuckle, it's kind of hard to see, but uh, bark, bark stripped again, even some of these younger stuff, even the size of your pen, you know, pinky, they still have the meticulous ability to get the, the bark off of that. And this is the property at, at my place. I, you know, I always kind of start trying to start after, you know, four or five, six years, you can see areas where I have mowed, but this is a waterway and this how how thick and lush and I'm also opening up the canopy while I'm having the goats there and all of this you can use to crawl through there was really a lot of bare soil. Um, but uh, kind of keeping my my trails maintained in my main areas just to really make it easily defense but also just really showing that uh, all the different diversity and stuff that we're starting to get to grow and trying to highlight that more because I don't really feel like I, I, I myself and a lot of other goat companies kind of can kind of talk about what the end result is. Everyone's kind of thinking the one year or two year or whatnot and, and what to kind of expect, but uh, kind of feel like I've seen the other side and I feel like I'm on that side of it, but, and uh, kind of sharing that now, but you know, we're about eight years in one of the, one of the first companies to start up kind of in the state. So, you know, we're just still collecting data and we're just still curious to see kind of how things, but we're finally getting enough time under our belt and our research to be able to start saying some some pretty cool stuff. Uh, the, yeah, this is my son out there this summer. This is kind of an example of how I kind of do a lighter treatment now. So when you get further along, get the buckthorn, you start getting some good stuff. I don't take everything to the ground, just have them eat the upper brush, kind of stop because they have a lot of good uh, of uh, forbs and sedges and stuff that I leave and release and then let the goats move on. So I find my treatments have been uh, much lighter as I go. And then also on my own property, not actually always grazing in the summer. There's times where I don't even graze my property in the summertime. Um, if it's mostly brush, I'll just do it in the wintertime when everything's dormant under the snow, especially when I get some high value species. And there's some just beautifulness of goats eating more buckthorn. I can, can never get enough of watching these types of pictures. So sorry, I probably put a little too many of these in here. Uh, here's another good shot that I like, just one year prickly ash. In the winter time, they uh, stripped all the bark of that. It was a taller one. They couldn't reach to the top of that. But then the next year, you see all the stuff that came up underneath is all that new light availability. I don't even need to knock it down. They can, it's going to fall down naturally. But just how easy and how much more forage production was able to be created by having these animals out in the cool season. Uh, up steep slopes, uh, did definitely 
uh, goats are starting to work at more elm trees too. And in, in elm, some people love them, some people hate them, but um, they're just, you know, we just, we, they don't eat every one of them. They kind of start from smaller diameter to larger. So it's just good to kind of thin out. And once you see the other side of letting light in and, and all the stuff that can grow, it's much more easier to cut down trees. More options of that, it's more buckthorn. Siberian elm, this is another beautiful uh, a pairing that we found that goats really do good well in that. Black locust bark. Um, I think these are some aspen, or aspen type trees. Again, Siberian elm. Uh, Siberian elm after the next year after being stripped, that tall one. Cedar trees. Yeah, I've done some experiment kind of going out on crop fields and stuff. And I do a little bit of this and I've had them on some crop residue, corn, soybean and whatnot, but in the grazing business, uh, I'm not really getting paid for this. So don't really do too much of this much anymore, but still that they have the ability to do that if you have this type of land around your property or neighbor's property and work in waterways and kind of fence lines along some of these fields and learning how to move them up and down the road and call your sheriff and figure out if this is even legal to do, which I guess it is. And we've had some escorts, sheriff escorts to uh, move them across roads. Um, Buckthorn, we've done some research. Maybe we'll talk about that a little bit later, but uh, University of Minnesota coming out, they really love the berries. And we found that uh, they destroy a big high amount of the seed, uh, seeds and the berries from the uh, buckthorn itself. Garlic mustard, I love this plant, getting on this in the spring, really trying to get more land managers thinking about this. So this is one of the first uh, forbs that we get and we do a ton of acreage of garlic mustard. And I really see the goats really flourish on this plant and uh, would like to see more of that. Here's again, this kind of hard, big Siberian elm field. As far as you can see in every direction, they're stripping all the bark of those and uh, just totally changes the game in my opinion. Uh, doing some other research with other groups. This is testing, uh, goats on different cover crops and uh, trying to see if maybe there's some diseases that are being transmitted for food crops. So trying to always have the herd available for scientific research. Um, this is a, just a job where they have a remote control brush eliminator and, and letting that go in front and let the goats kind of behind, but just doing some hybrid stuff where there is machinery, there is some goats and just kind of some hybrid approaches. Christmas trees, Lowe's and other companies been good to bring those out and feed. We feed those out to the goats in the past and that's been really good. Um, and just an excellent food source for them in the cool season. Uh, this uh, started to do more of this, Northern Minnesota. It, I'm uh, doing more island work. Some of the, some of my uh, naughtiest goats get banned to the Northern uh, islands of Minnesota because uh, Tromon Islands they're not they don't like to swim they're not jumping or not getting out but they still do good work so i've been experimenting the last couple of years on more of uh, northern climate uh types of plants and it's kind of been fun they as long as you move the boat fast and you don't like stop they uh, don't pee or poop in there and they just jump right off and i use a herding dog and chases them right back in the boat and then when i'm out there i caught this uh, 50 and a half inch muskie which was pretty cool so just trying to find uh different ways or reasons to get goats out on the land. So having a lot of fun with it. And this is that island there that trying to, that island I dropped them off, working on the underbrush, trying to release some of those oaks and uh, working with some other different types of underbrush species that I'm interested in getting more data on. And this is an islands and just waterways. Again, just really open that up. And this is that same island after a couple of years. Uh, uh, the next frontier I'm trying to go with is water and just showing how well they eat uh, the brush down and get much more fibrous growth, much more plants growing right up to the edge. I really feel the goats are going to do wonders along water. And the delayed flowering thing, that's one thing a lot of pollinator uh, people don't think about. But when I pick these goats up in the late, late fall, just because we've had this uh, grazed, everything else was dormant and senesce, but this island was still full life, still full blooms, and just spreading out that pollinator time just like it used to be. We don't just have this big flush on a prairie and then all the, the flowers are gone and there's not any food left. So it's just kind of cool to see. Uh, this is me getting the goats off a little bit too late. The, the bay froze up. So I had to bust ice all the way out there to get them. So I'll probably do that a little bit different next year, but they're just finding ways and kind of ways, ways to have fun with it. Um, just got a little bit more here and then we'll jump into questions. But uh, yeah, this and going into more prairie environments. And I, I know uh, a lot of people are always thinking woods, but 
I don't know. I haven't found a I haven't found a spot yet that I wouldn't like to see goats working on. They they do wonders for prairies, they wonders for wetlands, they went wonders for woodlands. Um, goats are just excellent and wonderful in every way. And and just seeing what you get naturally, these are some of the plants that uh, are coming up. This used to be a pretty goldenrod heavy field, but just a couple years of maintenance and and working on that kind of get more diversity and also being able to work on a lot of the brush while they're working on the brush. And then, uh, yeah, some of the other spots in the woods, just letting up, getting more and more good stuff to grow. This is, uh, I try to take pictures of blue cohosh. This is a plant that's kind of a trickier one to get in a forest understory. And, and seeing that grow and spread naturally every year, it's like, I mean, you can come out and take all the data you want, but I, I mean, I just take pictures and videos. I see it spreading. I feel it looks wonderful. I'm, I'm seeing, you know, much less bare soil. And uh, and I've turned, this is kind of, it's hard to really get a before picture, but this is kind of what the woods that I'm talking about looked like before, really over choke, big, tall stuff. And then now this is uh, my same woods, like my kids and I are uh, walking out looking for mushrooms. They're not tripping, we're not getting cut up. So I try to really talk to clients and stuff about, don't really get your, your, your uh, stuck on like, hey, is a buckthorn dead or alive? This, just kind of talk about, hey, uh, being able to have all these plants come in, have this open openness to it and let the breeze through the light through everything's good and and just watching some of these asters coming in naturally that uh are just kind of and, and just uh it's just fun to see and, and one thing i was just really excited about is that you know with having young kids is just uh and, and like sherry talked about we you know when we first started you know five ten go it's 50 then 100 and now we've managed 500 last year and probably going to be closer to 800 this year just your management style changes your lanes I've been working with my buddy in kansas for making different kind of shoots and stuff like that i was pretty proud of my kids if you have a nine-year-old and a seven-year-old that were able to sort through i don't know what's in the paper there about 25 goats get all the names and roll call and run them all through themselves without me even touching them. So they're using the handling system themselves. And it's an animal that I feel safe for my kids to be working on. Um, and just uh, kind of in closing here, just talk about a YouTube channel that I have out there that you can find through Goat Dispatch and uh, some other resources that after the cool season or the winter rental grazing of goats. And the other, project I'm working on is uh, grazegoats.com, basically making uh, some uh, videos on how to graze, learn the business of grazing, also trying to make some tracks for landowners and homeowners or land managers just to know uh, just different ways that you can uh, work on, on land and just try to get that, that information out there and uh, you know, speaking to groups like this on, on ways that uh, we can get more goats out working on the land and all that type of stuff. So. I always like to close with this. I feel like, you know, you never really change things by fighting the existing reality to change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. So I, I do my fair share of getting involved in restoration or Facebook groups or discussions and just really trying to uh, bring people out and, and share that, that there is another, there are other ways and I feel better ways to uh, manage some of the land around us. And uh, yeah, so it, it's an exciting time to see. I feel, I felt a lot of resistance say starting and now I feel at least in Minnesota, we're starting to kind of turn the corner. We're getting more and more work with, with the DNR, with parks, with cities. Um, we had a really big problem with ordinances and ordinances uh, not really being good for uh, using this type of business. But now I used to be able to figure out all the on my one hand all the towns that it was legal to work with goats on and now it's getting to the point where it's i can fit on one hand all the towns that i can't work in anymore um, some are more restrictive than others but i think we're we're going in the right direction goats as you can see are going in the right direction for pricing and also the usage that they can use on the land is going in the right direction so i think we're in exciting times and and that's all i have awesome oh that was great as well thanks jake and, and thanks sherry um 
for those of you who are still with it, it is after 7.30, so I want to respect all your, your, your time. And if you want to take off, you're welcome to, but I am going to go through a, a few of these questions that were asked and Sherry answered a bunch of them in the, in the chat, which I appreciate because we uh, probably would be here another hour or more if we went through all of the questions one by one and stuff. So I'll start with the, 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 a few questions here that were asked kind of specifically about Jake's talk. Um, the first one is how much water is needed as natural fence um, certain depth or width of waterway needed as you started talking about using that as your, <laughs> your island goats. Sure. Yeah, I, I like anything they really can't jump over easily and also make sure there's like not a tree falling across like if you're going along a stream. Definitely have certain goats that are pushed the limit of being able to walk in some more of the, the wetter areas. But as long as you make sure your herd leader, your like your dominant leaders of the group aren't uh, super keen on water you can kind of uh, build on that. And then also when it freezes, I, I find goats don't like to really cross freshly frozen ice when it's slippery, but if you get a freeze and then a snow on, the, on it, then they just walk right across. Cool. Um, would you mind unsharing your screen just so you two uh, kind of come to center of screen here? Um, Jake, what was the liquid protein supplement that you use? Sorry, I'm making you multitask now. <laughs> Sorry, yeah. I don't know that. Um, I don't know how. Oh, there it is. Stop share. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah, it's called Mix Thirty. I have to drive to Iowa to get a someone. I would love someone to be a dealer, man. So they use it in cattle a lot, cattle farms and stuff like that. But it's just been uh, been been a good mix for us to use, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, I've liked it. Cool. Um, and then somebody had asked, and I'm curious about this one as well, the financials of winter feeding versus shipping uh, and feeding them to Kansas. Do you have any numbers on that? So I'm, that's why I was interesting to see kind of Sherry's numbers. And again, I'm not a numbers guy. I'm kind of a, I mean, ecologist, that's my bag. I, I hate numbers. I hate seeing in the office, but I, I send them down to Kansas and I'm paying last year is like 10 bucks ish per head per goat per day, but then, oh, the corn tire and this or that. So I'm paying anywhere from 12, $12 to $15 a head per month uh, per animal down there. Um, so, and that's, I mean, and you got to also figure, I mean, that's his labor time down there. And, and uh, you know, I, after running day and night all day long, moving these goats on, on umpteen jobs, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of sick of looking at them. They're kind of sick of looking at me. We both get a couple months off, I guess. So it's that, you know, other just than the numbers part of it. And then also um, they, he, he, uh, he feeds them really well. I'm not, I'm not going to lie or, or sugarcoat that anything. I mean, I have goats that I have been able to do completely on brush or this or that, but I find down there, he, you know, he's keeping track. He, he sorts these goats and his pens and, and different things by every uh, three pound increment. So there's like, so there's not any bullying going on. I mean, he's definitely got a system going on down there and uh, really can track the numbers and he changes different mixes, the different feeds. So we're, we make a good partnership there. And I also find that when they come back to me, I have just a lot less problems. I remember putting our goats through, you know, moving a lot and kidding all different, you know, in the spring and stuff like that. It just feels, I, I felt, I felt good and I didn't have as much, uh, say bottle babies or other stuff to kind of deal with. So it's just for that reason, since we're so mobile and doing so many of these parks and stuff, it just really worked out really well for us. But I, yeah. again, I'm still, still leaving some, and I do have some up here that I am still practicing on doing that and working on ways. And, and, and one day I'll probably have to, I'm not sure how I'm gonna go if I'll keep going with that model, but I also know that people in the cattle industry are sending uh, uh, the farm business manager that I work with, uh, someone sends like 200 or 300 head of cattle to uh, Nebraska every winter and it still works even with those larger uh, animals yeah. transport. So it's something to consider. Yeah, no, I, I think it is. We actually sent our cow herd down to Nebraska to graze corn stalks for the winter and oh. works better. And like you said, it's nice to have a break, but Jerry, <laughs> I'm curious how that compares to your wintering costs. Uh, if you can, I don't, maybe you talk specifically on those numbers, but 10 to 12 bucks a month, I think is what Jake had said. How does that compare to doing it yourself? So we, um, I need, I probably should split out the winter. I haven't split out my winter costs from my summer costs. Um, hmm. And the numbers, the numbers that I have are for the does 
for their entire their entire year because I look at the does as my overhead cost and yeah. um, maintaining those does to produce the kids that are the saleable item. Whereas Jake has the saleable item is the the um, the business the um, services that he provides and the goats are the um, agents for providing that uh, service and so he can charge on on that and for me it's just the the does and for for them it's like 20 I, our calculations um, were around twenty dollars mm -hmm. per doe per month I believe so ours would be higher than what Jake is talking about there um, mm -hmm. But I, I, I guess I should point out I, that 12, that 10 to 12 to 15 dollars per month for that's what I'm paying down there. That's not including shipping, you know, like transport. So we got to put that in there. And so some of the goats I'm transporting down there. And sometimes I have a big enough class so that I just pay a transporter. So it just depends. Like sometimes I get the spring or if I need goats down there, I know they're always nine hours away. I can just jump in my truck and go grab some more. So just having that <laughs> opportunity to do that. So I, I've been saving on some of those costs, but that's, I, so it's not a, I want to say that. That makes either. sense. Yeah. I gotta add that. Yeah. I, I could probably add that in. Sure. Um, Jake, I'm curious, she actually brought up a good point there. I'm like, how does the breakdown of your, I, I don't, the profitability, I guess, of do you, of your kids and like the actual marketable product as well as the business, how do they compare if at all? Um, yeah. So I, I'm really bad at selling goats and just because I need so many for the grazing business right now, I mean, literally like anybody that I can get and, and after having such a hard time getting them and now with the prices the way they are it's just like my buddies in kansas like dig you know what we can sell these for and i'm like oh man it's really hard not to sell them to hang on to the machine or whatever you know for yeah. for grazing because i sell them i got to go back and buy them again so um but uh yeah i guess so i have not sold a lot of goats it's usually the ones that are like really not doing too hot or really wormy or just a real pain but i I sell very little goats, so I'm not a good one. That's why I'm glad Sherry is giving some numbers on for people for that kind of stuff. And 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 then get to the point one day where we can sell breeding stock and that type of stuff. Uh, we're getting there, but again, we're still still growing. But we're starting to get enough animals where I can maybe start letting some go. But that's going to be tough for everybody, no matter where you're at in the world. I mean, I've been I've, most of my goats have been getting from Texas, uh, Oklahoma, but mostly Texas and. Uh, yeah, I guess good luck in finding goats, I guess. Just let people know. <laughs> I mean, just to warn you, you know. So are you keeping of. all your males even as well, just to just to have something else to graze or yourself? Yeah, those? yep. All my weathers too. And and the weathers do really good for the winter work that we're building up, you know, and they're just really easy keepers. But again, it's yeah, he reminds me daily how much I could get for those things. <laughs> so but <laughs> You know, and, and just understand, but he knows my, what I'm going for. And it is fun. It's fun to kind of bounce that off of, and, and at least he, you know, and, and then ways we treat goats different. So he's not really doing brush business down in Kansas, but so just kind of, and we buying this, buying the same class of goats. I think we're an interesting experiment because we get the same goats. We both split them, you know, a herd from Texas and he, he treats them one way. I treat him another way. And we also got the, the dynamic of working in the brush, going down south and having a good buffet time down there and then coming back and just seeing like we weren't really sure how that was going to go from like and how the goats would ride that you know from being more like a forage base to getting fed more to forage base getting fed more and just trying to find goats that can kind of do it all I guess and and for us I mean that's what I really love about having goats and not letting them go is that they really get used to the trailer have a double director trailer like when they go in they, I have a ramp in the inside. They, they know how to hit that and I don't have to like push them or make them go up there very much. So it's just like mm -hmm. this logistics of getting, once you get like trained employees, you just don't really want to let them go. Makes sense. Yeah. Well, and you, and you make a lot more money. You, you should be making a lot more money using the goats for business as a service provider than selling them for meat. Exactly. The, yep. the, amount, the amount you could make in a year the services that they provide is so so superior to the amount that they'd be worth as just a meat animal on the market exactly yep i, I just keep saying goats to me are worth more alive than they are dead <laughs> or whatever. Yeah. but you know but and then letting letting people know that too and that's another thing i always want to warn people is like 
Um, hey, I mean, there's a there's a big learning curve to this, and I think that's one thing in talking to other people that are really honest. Like, you're going to have some losses. I mean, we we there was a some superior superior genetics that was selling out in can in Texas that we bought into, and and despite you know bringing them to Kansas, kind of wintering them down there, then bringing them into Minnesota. You know, we still had some pretty good percentage of losses and stuff like that. So, and they're a trickier animal to keep alive, um, just based on everything else. I mean, I have, I have sheep, I have geese, I have horses and all that kind of stuff. So, um, I know we talk a lot about how great goats are, but just, uh, just be cautious of that. Like Sherry says, kind of start small and, um, yeah, just ask a lot of questions because that's, and the, the, and people really don't like to tell how they feed them, especially, uh, people down in some of the states like as far as the, the, they feed I, th I think what I'm finding is people feed a, feed them up a lot more than they'll tell you so then you bring them home and then you're doing like oh I'm doing oh they're supposed to be oh they never were they never grained or whatever down there but then you roll up and you see all the corn feeders in their front yard or you know automatic feeders and so that that's the part I find in the industry is you know, it, and I'm not saying it's wrong to feed, but it just be up front when you're selling or getting, you know, these animals to people because they're used to that kind of stuff. And I have very real, you know, uh, like Sherry talked about dairy goats, just really not the be best luck with dairy goats. I love Nubians to death. My wife loves them, but they just, just don't have the, the, the skin coat and they're just used to, you know, they want to make milk and they're used on that high, high, uh, high diet there, unless you kind of cross them with some other stuff. Um, we've just been kind of gravitating away from those particular breeds. I really love Spanish goats. I know Sherry does a lot of Kikos. We have a lot of crosses, so I have kind of a lot of different genetics kind of going on in the herd. Cool. Um, one question that was <clears throat> sent to me directly here. Um, what should I look for in hiring a goat herd to clean up buckthorn in my various places that I maintain and what's the cost for the service? Yeah, I guess I would uh, just look for, you know, experience and kind of talk to them and see that, that the goat, you know, we have that great website that uh, that Elise has here, uh, hiregoats.com. Try to find someone close to you. Um, really talk to, I'm, I'm very open with our clients, why, what we charge and why we charge. And it's really, really boils down to how easy is the fence and how stressful they are to work with, you know. So we usually go in, I charge per acre um and higher per acre the first year i don't know them they don't know me make sure we work well together and then kind of work our way down from that um i've seen prices all over the board all the way from 150 dollars an acre all the way to three thousand dollars an acre i know that's a pretty big range and it's really hard to tell but i i'd say anywhere from that 200 to 600 dollars per acre is kind of a Kind of a, an average and it all depends on scale like are we doing 100 acres out in at a prairie or are we doing an eighth of an acre in the middle of st paul minnesota you know so it's just uh and and just kind of classify classify that i guess so there's i don't know if that helps you and uh in in uh and and i always i i think if you're starting out definitely start small do smaller jobs work in the woodlands um, I've been on a lot of jobs where I did a cost per acre and I thought it was going to take two weeks and ended up taking me two months. And so your goats are out work that whole time. So just really getting yourself calibrated to the areas that you're working in and try not to overextend yourself. And again, practice at your house, practice on your neighbors for free or some parks like that, just to and make sure that uh, you really like it. And you like the phone calls when you're trick-or-treating with your kids and you got to run somewhere, whatever, how much employees you want to run. We ran about uh, about eight employees last year and uh, just e every part of it just gets more complex and you got to kind of find your sweet spot. I think this is a question more for Shiri. Um, the goats need bedding refreshed in the, uh, in the portable shelters just like in a barn. Oh that was you. No never mind. Uh, in the I see. In, I, in the winter do goats keep their bedding clean if their shelter is inside a portable house? So is this uh, so is this plus a bale a good way to spread fertility on the land without needing more permanent winter housing? Sorry, I was reading your answer. You must have popped that in in between when I looked at the question and uh, asked it. But you went you went ahead and answered it. You can answer it uh, out loud if you'd like to. Sure. Yeah, they they do need um, bedding refreshed. So they will um, just they'll behave the same way in a barn as they do in the portable shelters. When if you watch goats, they bed down. When they wake up, they stand up, they pee, they poop right where they stood up, and then they move out to the food. So um, it's hard to get them um, 
unless they're bedding down outside the shelter, it's hard to get them to spread the nutrients outside of the, the sheltered area, um, which they will do if you're feeding them outside. They will, they will bed down outside and use the outside area way more than what people would claim that they, they do. And unless it's really windy or kind of wet, um, they will be outside. They like, they like being outside. Um, I think that is all the questions that we had uh, it, that Sherry answered quite a few in the in the chat too. So make sure you check on that. Um, one did just come in here. I'll ask, but um, the yeah, make sure you check through all the chat and see the the questions that she asked. I wish we had time to go through each one of them, but I don't want to keep here everybody here all night. Uh, the last question here is: Do you have tips for making the shelter easy to clean? Can you just tip it out, tip it up, and slide it out? Um, you could tip it up and slide it out if the the um, infrastructure that you built of the frame on the boat trailer is such that the back is strong enough that you can tilt it onto that. Um, we we generally um, just go in there and shovel it out. Um, the double deck uh, style is harder to do that in because it's a shorter ceiling height, but the single deck one is very easy to clean out. All right. Well, I really appreciate both of you. Do, do you guys each want to, I don't know if you have any last thoughts, mention, things you want to mention here before we wrap this up. I'll give you each a chance to do that. Otherwise, to share where people can find you um, if you want to share that. Maybe you don't want anybody reaching out, but if you are okay or want people reaching out or finding you, if you have questions, maybe uh, uh, point people in that direction. Sherry, we can start with you. Sure. Well, I, I thank you all for attending and your interest in goats. And um, there's there's some great things and the prices right now are really high in goats. And um, there's also um, some challenges with goats that don't make them for everyone. And the, the learning curve can be fairly steep. So if you're willing to commit to um, overcoming those challenges, um, goats are a great species and profitable, um, especially right now, and even more so if you use them for brush management services like what Jake is doing. Um, my contact info is in the presentation that I gave, which will be available as a PDF um, on the website. I'm also, I'll send um, Jared the uh, spreadsheet that I put together for calculating my percentage losses and um, herd growth projection stuff. Somebody asked for that. So I'll send that to you for posting also. And um, people can contact me by email or text or uh, Facebook, um, just under my name on Facebook. I'm out there. So. Awesome. Thank Thanks, Sherry. Time. And Jay? Yeah. And yeah, cool. Thanks uh, for talking, everybody. It's good to see so much excitement in goats out there. And they're definitely excited about goats and sharing that. Uh, I encourage people, I don't know if we talked about it in here, but there's a couple, like the, I think it's through the SFA, there's an ecological service livestock network that uh, helped kind of found and kind of keep going. And Carl Hawkinson does a really good job of all of our talks and other things that are coming out there and getting that out there. So you guys can watch some of those. And then internally I have, you know, the, video, the YouTube channel and then also the modules to help people. And um, yeah, if you just want to send me an email, usually works best if you have questions and I try to get to them all. And this time of year, try to <laughs> try to get away from people and goats. So don't take it personal. <laughs> Takes a while, but you got to rest a little bit and do some ice fishing and then get back out there when the sun starts coming up. But uh, yeah, but it's good to, good to get keep way to keep us going on this here, Jared, and all these other kind of talks here. So it's good. Yeah. No, thank you both. This was fantastic. And thanks everybody for listening. This will be up on YouTube here, hopefully in a couple of weeks. And uh, be sure to check out the ones on YouTube from the last three weeks or sign up for next week's on chicken if you're interested. So thanks everybody and have a wonderful, uh, wonderful night. Thank you.